to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of Christ. Be faithful until death in view of the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If there's one thing in Scripture that ought to motivate, to challenge, to compel us to live faithful to Jesus every moment, it is the second coming of Christ. Friend, the fact that Christ is one day going to return, is going to deliver us to the Father, ought to challenge and motivate us to never ever give up on Christianity. This lesson is going to deal with what the New Testament has to say on the second coming of Christ. It's going to show us that Christ's return, according to New Testament teaching, is inevitable. That we're not sure exactly when that's going to be, but some awesome events. It's going to happen, but we don't know definite on the time. God has not revealed that to us, but some awesome events are going to happen at the coming of Christ, and that ought to motivate and compel us to live faithful to Jesus each and every day. And so what does the New Testament teach about the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Realize this. The Scriptures clearly teach that Christ is coming again. His coming is inevitable. It is one thing that is definitely going to happen. So many passages teach this. In John 14, Jesus said to His disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions or many dwellings. Were it not so, I would have told you. And then He said this, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus promised the faithful that if you live true, I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you to the Father. Think about the words of Acts chapter 1. Here's one of the clearest passages in the New Testament about the second coming of Christ. Notice Acts chapter 1 verse 9. Now the context is Jesus is about to return to the Father He's giving His disciples some last moment instructions and encouragement about the kingdom. And look at what is said in Acts 1 verse 9. The Bible says, Now when He had spoken these things, while they watched, He was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, steadfastly toward heaven, as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and notice this, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so go, will so come in like manner as you saw Him go into heaven. And so here's the promise. You saw Jesus. He literally went on a cloud into heaven. And the writer says, and the angel says, that same Jesus is one day going to come on a cloud and He's going to return to receive His own. Paul said in Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21, our true citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus who will transform our lowly body into His body. We're patiently waiting because one day Jesus is coming. The Thessalonians changed their whole life in view of the second coming of Christ. They turned from idols to God to serve the true and living God and to wait for His Son from heaven. And friends, remember the promise of 1 Thessalonians 4? Jesus is one day going to return with a shout with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with Him in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. It is a fact. One day Christ is going to come. Now someone says, where does the Bible say, though, that the second coming is going to happen? I've heard people speculate and doubt that one day the Lord's going to come again, and they say, well, the Scripture never says anything about the second coming. I beg your pardon, but it does. Notice Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28 specifically mentions that. Look at these words. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. The Bible says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for Him. Notice this. He will appear a second time. Apart from sin, He came the first time to deal with sin and to make Himself a sacrifice. He's going to appear a second time. There's the second coming. Apart from sin. Well, what for? 
for salvation, just like 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and John 14. He's coming to redeem to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, those who are in the kingdom and those who have been faithful. And so, yes, Christ is coming again, and the second coming is clearly taught in Scripture. John said in 1 John 3, verse 2, or verses 1 and 2 that we need to realize the great love God has showered upon us that one day we're going to be changed when the Lord Himself returns again. With so much evidence for the second coming, why deny it? The Bible clearly teaches it's going to happen. And friend, understanding that will motivate, will challenge me every day to live for Jesus in view of that fact. Now, since it is going to happen, what do we know about the time of Christ's return? Can we know exactly when Christ is coming back? Can we know to the minute and the day, the hour, or what does the Bible say? There were some in the New Testament time that thought that Jesus' return would be immediate. Uh, much of First and Second Thessalonians deals with that. Some thought Christ would be coming any time, and so they basically gave up their jobs, and they were just sitting around waiting for Christ to return. And Paul said, you need to get up and get back to work and live your life. We don't know. He's going to come as a thief in the night. Some thought maybe that it would be a thousand years. Some thought it would be two thousand years. Uh, William Miller, Seven-Day Adventist, said in 1833, Christ would return in 1843. Then, of course, when Christ didn't return in 1843, he had to change his mind and say, well, he's coming in 1844. Well, we all know that didn't happen. Charles Russell, Jehovah Witness leader, said in 1914 that Christ would come in 1919. Finally, he decided that Jesus did come and only a few people saw that. And friends, that's not the way the Bible teaches. Every eye will see, every knee will bow. Philippians 2, all who are in the graves will come forth. John chapter 5. And so as we look at history, a lot of people had tried, have tried to predict when Christ will come. But what does the Bible say about the timing when Christ is going to return? And here's what's clearly taught. You can't get around this. The truth is no one, no one except God Himself knows when Christ is going to return. Notice the words of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. Jesus said this concerning His coming. Christ said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now when we're talking about the second coming, what can we know with surety? It's going to happen and nobody knows when. Jesus said, of that day and hour of my final return, nobody knows, the angels don't know, only the Father Himself knows. And friend, if Christ said, God is the only one who knows, how dare we try to predict when that's going to be? Nobody knows. What's it going to be like? First Thessalonians 5 verse 2, Jesus said, or Paul said, the coming of Christ will be like a thief in the night. What's that image relayed to our mind? Do you know when a thief is coming to rob you? Absolutely not. If you knew, you'd be sitting there waiting on him. A thief comes when nobody knows it and when you're least expecting it. That's the idea of Christ's return. Nobody will know when he's going to come back. And so be sure, when you hear all these prophecies, we heard them around the year 2000. Christ is coming back around the year 2000. We've heard them in the past. Centuries, people have predicted that. You can know this. Anytime anybody says... Christ is coming on this day, you can say, you know what, you're a false teacher and I'm not listening to you because the Bible says no one knows when Christ is going to come. Now someone says, well, why didn't God tell us? We may not know all the information, but I guarantee you this. A lot of people, I believe that one of the main reasons God did not tell us is because a lot of people would live their life like they wanted to right up to that moment and then they'd try to get right. God wants us to live faithful to Him all the time and to always be ready for His return and it keeps us on our toes living for Jesus every day. Now, when we think about Christ's coming, there are also some things, the, the nature of His coming, what's it going to be like? When Christ returns, well, what's going to happen? What kind of events are going to unfold and how does that encourage me? We learn that Christ's coming is going to be with great power and authority. Matthew 25, verse 31, it is seen as a powerful event. Judgment is going to be mitigated out. Men and women are going to fall down before God at that time. When we talk about the coming of Christ, when He returns, it's going to be personal. It's not just for the world. It's personal for me as well. First Thessalonians 4, all who are in the graves will come forth. John 14, Jesus said, I go to prayer place for who? 
for you. It is a personal event. It's not only happening for the world, it's happening for me. It's an unannounced event. First Thessalonians 5 verse 2, it's like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen, but the trumpet shall sound, the voice of an archangel will be heard, and it's not something that we're going to know of before. It's going to be audible. It's something we will hear though. Remember John 5 verses 28 and 29? All who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. The sound of the trumpet, the voice of an archangel, it's going to be something that we'll not only see, but we'll hear. But it's also visible. Acts 1 verse 11, it's something we'll see. This same Jesus whom you saw go into heaven will also come in like manner. And so not only will I hear it, but I'll see the return of Jesus in the air. Now concerning Christ's second coming, here are some things that are also going to occur. Some events that will happen in due with or in, in the same time in the same events of the second coming. For example, the resurrection is going to happen in conjunction with the second coming of Christ. Notice again the words of John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. Look at what Jesus Himself said here. Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection condemnation. When Christ's voice is heard, when that trumpet is blown, men and women are also going to rise out of the graves on that day. Some will rise to eternal life, some will rise to eternal condemnation. And this is also taught in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, Paul discussing the second coming of Christ and His return there teaches us that those who are in the graves will be caught up together with the Lord in the air and thus they shall always be with the Lord. And so in view of the second coming, we'll also know the resurrection is going to happen. Well, what else is going to happen in conjunction with the second coming? The judgment is also going to happen. Notice what the Scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Here's what God says. Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, notice this, who will judge the living and the dead as His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. When Christ comes, He is going to mitigate, mete out judgment to the living, those who are alive and not passed on from this life, and those who are in the dead who will come forth out of the graves. And so at the same conjunction with Christ coming, you've got people being raised and you've got the judgment occurring. Now another event that will occur is that God's vengeance will be meted out toward those who do not live faithful to Jesus in this life. I want you to look at the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 10 and, and this is all occurring in conjunction with Christ's return. Notice what the Bible says here. God says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Here's the picture. Jesus is coming. How's He coming? In a flaming fire to take vengeance on two types of people, those who don't know God and those who do not obey the gospel. These are going to be punished with everlasting destruction. They're going to suffer the fires of hell at that point. And so vengeance is going to be meted out. When Christ returns, men and women are going to be judged by the Word of God. John 12 verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me does not receive my word. He has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. Just as in that judgment scene in Revelation 20, books were opened and the dead, great and small, stood before God and each one was judged by the things written in the books. So it is when Christ returns. Men and women are going to be judged based on how they've lived their life according to the Bible and God at that moment will mete out vengeance, eternal punishment for those who have done evil and glorification to those who have done right. What else is going to occur at the second coming? We also know that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is God's Son. At that moment in time, all the critics will disappear. All the atheists will be no more. All the agnostics will no longer doubt. 
Every person will at that moment be convinced. Jesus is the Son of God and will bow and confess that to the Father. Notice these words. Philippians chapter 2 affirms this beginning in verse 9. Paul said, Therefore God has also highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those of earth, those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so here's the picture that when Christ returns, all people are going to know that He is God's Son and that God's plan was correct. Every person's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess that Christ is the Son of God. Also, during the time of Christ's coming, with con in conjunction with that, the kingdom is going to be delivered to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 teaches us that when Christ comes, He'll deliver the kingdom to the Father. Now what's the kingdom? The kingdom is the church, Matthew 16 verse 19. The kingdom is presently here. Mark 9 verse 1 and Bible teaches in Colossians 1 verse 13, there were people in the kingdom in the first century. The kingdom is the church. And so what's going to happen when Christ returns? Those who are in the kingdom are the ones who are going to live with the Father. Do you see the importance of being in the church and making sure we're living faithfully in the kingdom? The righteous are also going to be changed at Christ's return. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21 teaches us that our citizenship's in heaven from which we'll, we look for the Lord Jesus who will change our lowly body into His glorious body. Do I understand all that? Absolutely not. But friends, here's what I do know. My body will no longer be corruptible and my body will no longer be uh, mortal. It will be changed into immortality. And also at this time, the righteous will be given that victor's crown. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I I've kept the faith. Henceforth has laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me on that day, but not to me only, but to all those who've loved His appearing. Now there's one final event that is also going to occur in conjunction with the second coming of Christ and that is this, the world and all that's in it will be destroyed. Notice your Bible, what your Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 9 through 12. The scripture says this, Therefore, excuse me, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slowness or slackness, but as long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming, coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. What else is going to happen? Friend, this a world which we live right now is going to cease to exist. When Christ returns, when God meets out His judgment, when the dead are raised and all who are faithful meet God in the air, Christ is going to destroy this old world. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night and the heavens, the elements, all that's in it is going to be burned up with the fervent heat. Now, here's what that ought to do. That ought to motivate and ought to challenge me, but it ought to teach me this also. There are some who teach that the thousand year reign of Christ is going to come after His return. Now friend, I ask you, if the world and all that's in it is going to be burned up, where's that going to take place at? You see, that's a contradiction because in the book of Revelation, people go to passages that are figurative to try to bring out the thousand-year reign and the rapture and all these things, and God never intended for that to be the teaching there. He's teaching us in that context that Christians are going to rule and reign with Christ in heaven. We're going to have that place of hope and comfort but this whole world's not going to be a place where we're reigning or where Christ is reigning at all. It, at the coming of Christ, will be burned up. And there's no doubt that that passage clearly shows with great force how that's going to take place. Now, it also ought to encourage me this way. If this earth and all that's in it is one day going to be burned up with a fervent heat when Christ returns, why in the world would I want to put my treasure and my hope right here in this old world? What good will it do me if I've got the biggest house on the block and the fanciest car and the nicest clothes in the world 
And when Christ comes, all those are burned up with a fervent heat. What's that going to matter? And the point is, it won't. And so let's not put our hope in this world. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart be also. Matthew 6, verse 24 following. And our treasure, according to that context, needs to be putting the kingdom first. Matthew 6 and verse 33. Now, in view of all this, what ought to be my conduct? How does that motivate me? How does the teaching about the second coming motivate, challenge, compel me every day to live for Jesus? Well, here's what it ought to do. It ought to cause me to wait patiently for His return. We eagerly wait. Philippians 3 verse 20. James 5 verse 7. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7. We are waiting for the Lord Jesus. Just like those in Thessalonica, we turn from sin to God and now we're waiting for the return of Christ. It ought to cause me to be patiently enduring Never give up, endure patiently, and to have faithfulness, waiting faithfully for that day. It's like the waiting for the greatest event you can imagine in your life. And you're anticipating, you're waiting it, you've got butterflies about it, you're so ready for it to happen, but you're patiently enduring until that day. That's what Christ's coming ought to do for us. It ought to cause me to be pure and to blameless in my life. In Philippians 1 verse 10, we're taught to live a pure and blameless life. In view of the coming of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13 and 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, we ought to be pure and spotless and blameless because Christ is coming. I don't know when that's going to be. I know what's going to occur in view of that. There are no second chances after that. It ought to make me live a pure life. Be holy as He who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 15. It ought to make me realize without holiness no one's going to see God. Hebrews 12 and verse 14. The second coming of Christ also should encourage me to live a sober, righteous, and godly life. Titus 2 verses 11 through 13 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly, looking for the great appearing of our glorious God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need, in view of Christ's coming, to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Do you remember what Peter asked? 2 Peter 3, verse 11, Since all these things are going to happen, what manner of persons ought we to be in all godly conduct, holy conduct, and righteousness? We, because of that, must live, in view of the second coming, as a spotless child of God. Does that mean I'm not going to sin? No, I'll sin. But it means when I do, I'm immediately ready to make that right. And here's what else it does for us. It causes me, it ought to cause me and you to set our hope fully on the coming of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1 teaches us that our hope must be fully set on Christ and His return and His kingdom and His promises. That's where my hope is. I have the hope of the resurrection. I have the hope of Christ's coming. I know these things are going to happen. And in view of that, I want to live faithful to Jesus every day. And friend, it ought to motivate me. Here's how it ought to motivate us. Since all these things are going to happen, I don't know when it's going to be. I know the things that are going to occur with it. That that ought to motivate me every day to live for Jesus. Now here's what that means. It ought to motivate us to realize the importance of now. How do you know? How do you know that Christ's coming is not going to be very shortly? Well, it may be 10,000 years and it may be two minutes. We don't know, but it could be any time. And so it ought to reinforce in our minds the importance of obeying God now. In view of this, if you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, this ought to stress to you the importance of now. Listen to what the Bible says about that word now. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, We then as workers together with Him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, In an acceptable time I've heard you, in the day of salvation I've helped you. Listen, Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. How important is now? It's essential that you understand now you have the opportunity. Now you have the time. Now you have the chance. When Christ comes, all that's over. We need to take advantage of right now. We need to get our life ready. I believe one of the saddest verses in the Bible is found in Acts 26 verse 28. Paul preaches to Agrippa he talks to him about righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. He preaches Jesus and he knows these things, Paul says. And here's what Agrippa says. Almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. My friends, the saddest line when Jesus comes back will be, 
I almost obeyed the gospel. Our life is like a vapor. James 4 verse 14. And so we need to understand the importance of now and we need to get ready. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do that now. You need to get ready now. You need to hear the word. You need to believe in Jesus. You need to repent of things in your life that are not right. You need to confess Him as Lord, Romans 10 verse 10. And you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. But if you are a child of God and these lessons are to motivate those of us who are, it ought to cause us, the second coming ought to cause me to live faithful to Jesus. Remember the words, be faithful until death. Matthew chapter 10, he who endures to the end shall be saved. It ought to cause us every day to take up our cross and follow Jesus faithfully. It ought to cause me to, in view of God's grace and mercy, to make my life a living sacrifice. If there's anything today that ought to motivate you to live faithful, it's the second coming of Christ. Our Lord is coming. I don't know when. It's going to be a powerful event and I want to be ready. I want to be ready to be caught up with Him in the air, to meet Him in the air, and to go home with the Father, and I don't. I sure don't want to be caught unaware. Friend, is your life the way it ought to be? Are you ready today for the Lord's coming? Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, take advantage of now. If you are a Christian, live faithful to God in view of the second coming of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.